Okay. All right. So, anyways, um, I want to introduce Raj Moholtra. 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 And um, <laughs> <laughs> he, um, he goes as the name Raj Mahal for short. And Raj and I have been friends for a long time. We, um, I, I got to know Raj, I believe, but I, the first time we met is at Bank of America, right? Yes. Yeah. No, and, BNP, actually, I think. Well, I met yeah, him. Bank of America, though. Yeah, yeah. I, I knew him from BNP, but I really started doing business for him at Bank of America. Um, Raj, I think between all the rooms right now, we have probably um, about 150 people, about 120 people signed up for the boot camp, and then we've got probably 30 to 35 people in the main room. We've got probably 30 or 40 in the, in the uh, or 50 people in the, in the MIM. Um, so here, here's the thing. If, if there's any of you guys want to ask any questions throughout this, just ask them because when Ron starts talking, um, you know, sometimes it's hard. You can, people will ask questions right here and you can yeah. type back, but maybe it's better to answer the questions after. I'll try, yeah, I'll try and answer this. If there's any questions during that, that are pertinent, I will uh, try and answer them. Okay, so. Um, you, can, you can make it smaller so I can see the. Uh, the, the, the oh yeah, yeah. Text box. Okay. I know it's on the squad. Okay. All right. All right. So, anyways, like I said, a couple of weeks ago we were out, and um, the funny thing was that Raj can Raj knows this is true. We were at a bar down. He we, we went. We were driving around downtown Delray, and we went out for a beer at a place called Johnny Brown's, and. I, I kind of, the, the markets were acting funny on the Friday, the Thursday and the Friday before the Monday where the stock market sold off real hard. And as I was walking, we were walking into the bar, I said something to Raj. I said, Raj, you know, I said this s and not acting right. And I don't think anybody really, nobody could have known what was going to happen. But um, he said, well, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a dip buyer's market and, you know, it, it is what it is. And. You know, we were talking about how the quantitative easing and the bond buying and PPT and the markets holding together. And then as we were, as we as we left the bar, I said it again to him. I said, "Look, I'm kind of worried about this. I go, this doesn't act right." That Thursday night, I think it was a Thursday night, um, on Globex, I think the S and P. I can't remember what the price was. It was like 28, 28. 30 something, 35. And then all of a sudden it drops like 12 or 15 handles at night down to like, just out of the clear blue, it just drops like 12 or 15 handles. And we had, we had had dinner here. And while we were here, I pointed out to Raj and then later in the night, I said it again to him. I was like, I don't know, Raj, this stuff doesn't look good. You know? And I, I, I said, he said, oh, that's all right. And, you know, it'll bounce, you know? And, you know, then that, Friday morning when things started getting selling off, um, all I could think of to myself was that we had not had any 5% corrections. We had only, the last 10% correction was in August of 2015. And I was thinking to myself, they're going to get a 5% correction. You know, can they get a 10% correction? But anyways, um, over the last couple of weeks, we've gone out a couple of times and we were out with a group of people, I think last Thursday night having dinner. And that was when I started to ask Raj about the VIX. And Trader Dave's cousin Greg was there, and he he runs a trading firm that had 120 people at it. And moved down here to kind of start talking about maybe opening up a hedge fund. But very smart group of people that were at the table. And I, I said to I said to Greg, Greg said, I said, did you see that press release by the Chicago Mercantile? And he said, no, which one? I said, it said that it, it did record, it is record open interest and record value. And he looked at me, he goes, well, man, you know, I think that's good. That's good news. You, you probably got to buy the CME stock. And I was like, well, Greg, I don't know about that. I go, generally when volume jumps like that, in, in cases when the markets fall off, that's like not good volume. That's like big liquidation volume. People being forced to hedge, people being forced out of the market, people... And he looked at me, he's like, you're probably right. And then I said, something to him about the VIX. Did he see the VIX and the, some of those other products? And I don't know enough about the VIX to really be one to talk about. I do know that 
We watched it go up to 50-30, you know, in a matter of a couple of days. But Raj does. He, Raj, because he ran that big book, he's very familiar with the VIX. And when we were talking about it, we were talking about these hedge funds that blew out because they were short gamma. They're called premium sellers. There was one called LJM in Chicago. I think they lost 60% of their value on one day. And their mutual fund lost 80% of their value. And then Raj was talking, he's like, well, you know, I could probably be an expert witness on something like that. I said, well, they, there was an article in Bloomberg. There was a lot of articles about the VIX, VIX manipulation. And VIX, and Raj started saying, well, there's no doubt about the, that there's VIX manipulation. And, I, and that one story where the guy came out saying that there was a lot of spoofing going on in the VIX. So anyways, I don't have anything in particular to ask Raj, but like I said, while during his presentation, um, he's only got four slides, but get as much out of this as you can, you guys. Um, yes, can you, can you, can I ask a question too? Yes, you can for sure. Um, but here, here's the, here's, here's Raj. I'll let Raj take over from here. Um, here's the keyboard if you want to answer from there. And here's the mouse. So, okay. hey, Marlon, can you move the slide? Yeah. So, hi, everyone. This is Raj here. So, again, the question is, did the VIX cause the mini crash of 2018? Okay. So, let's go back to what happened on February 5th, which was the, uh, the Monday, if you remember, after the Super Bowl, which Kramer liked to call it the, the Pats crash. <laughs> So basically, the, that day, the Dow dropped uh, 1,175 points, which was the biggest drop in history in points. And, and again, it's, it's, a relevant, it's sort of an irrelevant number because in percentage drop, it's only 4.2%, which is nowhere near the biggest drop in history. Yeah, again, if you remember in 2008, the S&P would move 4%. The, the implied vol was that would move at some point 5% a day. So how did you handle I'll, I'll get to stuff like big stops. Um, so let's go through this. So 4% 4, 4 moves that back then were pretty commonplace. Remember the VIX got up to like 80, which in very uh, layman's terms, a, a VIX of uh, 16, 16.25 to be exact, but a, a VIX of 16.25 means that the market um, expects the S&P to move an average of 1% a day going forward. So it's pretty linear. So a 2% move would be 32 and a half. A 4% move will be 64 and a half VIX. So again, it's, it's just a, in, in point drop, it's a big headline, but it's not as important as um, the actual percentage move. But why that was so shocking was on Friday, it, it dropped 666 points and it moved at over a thousand points on February 8th. So there's three very big moves in the last, in a uh, five day period, which is, and if you remember Friday, it was it was all the way down, and it was a 107 point uh, handle from top to bottom. So the question is again, why? Why all of a sudden was the market not was had pretty much zero volatility for a year for over a year, basically since Trump was elected, and then now there was a there was a big volatility event. And what was it? That was the big question. Not that it, not that it happened. Everyone, not everyone, but most people expected that eventually we'd have some correction or some kind of vol. And when vol comes back, it doesn't just come back. It comes back quick and it comes back very quickly and suddenly and, and it can be painful. And the question is why? And then the, the talking heads, you'll hear about inflation fears and that's not true. The 10 year, it's not true. I don't think any of that. It was all to me, was driven by the VIX. The VIX was what drove down that market. And let me explain to you how and why the the spike in the VIX caused the events of February 5th, 2018, especially in the last hour. Um, so can we, can we move to go to the next slide? Marlon, can you go to the next slide? Okay. Okay. So as Danny touched, talked quickly about with the, uh, the XIV and the short volatility trade, Basically, the XIV was a reverse VIX um, product, and it was it, it was a very popular trade for a long time. As you saw, if you could look at a, a chart of the VIX or the XIV or, or every every one of these uh, vol products, there's 
UVXY, there's the VXX. There's before 2008, there were no vol ETFs. They just didn't exist. And out of um, the events of 2008, it created a uh, demand for a vol product, given what happened in vols in 2008. They, they basically all came to market around 2010 and beyond. And for the better part of seven, eight years, um, being short vol was a home run trade. Uh, this, some of the returns, like this XIV, it, it, reverse, it reverse split a, a, a few times. And it basically went, in, in, this day, in this day, I believe it went from 140 all the way down to five. Basically, it lost all of its value in pretty much one day. And what happened was the rise in the VIX across the board led the market down and it created a perfect storm. And this is, let me explain to you exactly what the perfect storm was. The VIX, as, um, as the VIX rose, I could see, I saw this XIV thing was broken. It was a, it was a rolling note. Um, there, there were a lot of um, uh, ETNs and um, exchange traded notes in Europe, which were tied to the short ball trade. I personally know a guy that lost, a, a, a friend of mine here, he, he basically lost a million dollars of his own money being, being basically being short ball in one day. All, he, he made, he, he made about 500 grand in the last two or three years. He kept telling me how great this trade was and he lost a million bucks in one day. So you can see, you could, and as a, as a guy, you should trade this product. You could see this going, they were just running. There was a run on the VIX. They knew they could break this XIV product because the XIV and these vol ETFs, they, they all work in a, in, in a, in a structured market, in a, a market where there's liquidity and a normal, Hash, you know, in air quotes, a normal market. But once, once, once there's chaos, once there's no uh, liquidity, the thing can just get broken, and that's basically what happened. So I could see this rise in VIX. I mean, I I was able to make a lot of money because I could see this starting to break. I was I bought all these. Uh, I guess I got long vol because I could see that this was breaking, and against most of my long positions, it was it was a home run. But what happened was because of the rise in the VIX, that that once we saw once the VIX started rising, it caused to get risky across the board. And let me explain to you how that was. So the holders of all these short volatility products, they had to liquidate their stock portfolios to meet margin calls because the um, the VIX products were up like hundreds of percents. So they had to like what what was the margin on what the amount of margin they had on uh, VIX or on these uh, vol ETFs just was wiped out. It was wiped out. It went blew through all the margin calls. So they not only had to liquidate this position, they also had to liquidate their, 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 long, their long stock positions. Now, of course, people like me know that. Um, so it wiped out many retail portfolios, but also it wiped out the structured notes in Europe, uh, mostly where we're short the VIX. And um, the other thing, and, 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 the, and the real... The real issue was these. Um, not only that, there there were these uh, insurance products, mostly by insurance companies. Called, they, they're called many different things. They all have different names for them, but in essential, essentially, they're called portfolio weighted volatility portfolios. Where essentially, what happens is, say the VIX is it at, say the VIX is at, say ten, that's when they're max invested. As the VIX goes higher, say it goes to twenty, then they're half invested, so have to sell half of their portfolio and it gets to 30 and 35 and it sell everything. So that VIX, as the VIX rose, all those, all those uh, products, all those portfolios were forced to liquidate. It was a forced liquidation. So that created massive amounts of selling, of stock to sell because of the VIX rise. Now, of course, people like me, Al, Al, the algos know this themselves, of course. And so, th so let, because of the rise in VIX, and at the time of the day, it was, you remember when it really started crashing was around three to three thirty. All the algos and, and vault traders and all desks knew how much stock was for sale, and we could see it happening. And that's why the moves were so big, so quick, so fast. Um, can you move? Can you go to the next slide? Because I want to. Because that's only part. Of that that's only half the story of of all, all the stock for sale. So the time being, the time in the last hour exacerbated the move. And, and the other thing is the amount in the, the growth of ETF products in the last five to seven years, 
I think it's like four or five fold. So basically what happens is every ETF provider, um, think about this. So every ETF provider, I have to rebalance their portfolios daily. And the more the market sells off, the more they have to sell. So just think on a, on a vacuum. Just say that um, a, uh, a, a ETF has $30 billion in assets and they sell off. The market just sells off 5%. They have to sell off. They have to sell. So what they do is they hold $30 billion worth of stock versus the ETFs that they're basically short to the marketplace. So as the market moves down 5%, they've got to sell um, 30 million times 5%. So that's uh, one, one and a half billion dollars. But that's not even counting how much was actually sold for the day. So say an ETF had about $30 billion of shares outstanding. And at the end of the day, a third of that was liquidated. So now they have $20 million left. They have $10 billion to sell plus the other um, one and a half billion. So they have eleven and a half billion dollars of stock for sale into the close at three, at basically in, in their mark against the close. So people like us, people that are desk know that there's if this guy has at least one eleven half billion for sale, twenty other guys probably have the same. Plus the algos were front running this. Plus the ETF um, portfolio wage strategy that had to sell stock. And so it was just created a perfect storm of everybody needing to be out at four o'clock. And that just wiped and that just caused chaos. And that's what caused that big thousand point drop in the S&P in literally 15 minutes. So it, it, in essence, that VIX led, the, the, the rise in the VIX led to the sales and uh, led to liquidations in stock, um, retail stock portfolios. It led to um, the portfolio wage strategies needing to sell all their stock because of the VIX rise, because they had to be out of that. And then it led to the ETFs having to sell all of their stock. And this, and um, it was obvious due to the market conditions that day that the, they, that all the algos and everyone else front ran that heavy selling pressure, which was with 100% certainty had to go into the close because. All, all these companies, like the ETFs themselves, they don't care where it closes. They just need to be, they just need to be flat at the end of the day and keep their uh, management fee. So they want no risk in their portfolio, which is because they're literally just keeping their um, management fee. And we knew that the unwind this trade could take days. And it's, but I mean, but shockingly, actually, it, it, it only, it did seem to subside the day after. And you can tell in the market two days later, um, the algos again tried to front run. They thought there was a retest. When the retest of the lows, they thought that it was the, the trade was going to happen again. But it was this time it was just we can't try to push it out because I think most of the trading was uh, unwound that day. So that's I, I think that's what happened. Um, I'm sorry, on the Friday the retest of the lows as we really tried to push it down. It was a weak hand, and that was kind of it. So if you ask me now, where where are we now? I think we're at a place where Volatility is, it's not going to go, the, the VIX shouldn't go back to a, uh, the VIX shouldn't go back to a uh, level where we were pre-market, but I would say that uh, a lot of the volatility, of the short volatility squeezes out of the market at this point. And you can look to selectively use the inflated vol to enter position should market sell off. If it, my, my, my advice is if you, there are names, there are single stock names that you like here at levels. And when stuff gets dislocated, selling puts into that um, at, at, to get to enter stocks at levels that are uh, that are attractive to you is, is actually a pretty good strategy going forward, especially fundamentally names that you think are just being pushed down because of this. A great example of that for me that day was Boeing. Boeing was a name that was a, a, an obvious buy. I told everyone in the world to buy it at 320 as just a trade. It was a name that I knew that that was just being pushed because the Dow was being pushed lower and being the biggest name in the Dow because it is a price weight index was a pretty obvious trade for, for me there. I mean, I, I went all, basically all in on Monday night at 11 o'clock and that's kind of how I see the, uh, I, that's kind of how I saw the vol unwind happening. So hedge stocks, it was a mini warm up squeeze on the short volatility players the previous week in the VIX. Yeah, I, I mean, there, there's no doubt if you're asking about the VIX, is it manipulated? It's absolutely manipulated because, I mean, on a very fundamental, on a very basic level, um, 
as, as as market makers, you have to put in futures orders that you intend to be executed. And we see the size of trades that go, the uh, size of orders that I put in the order book. They're clearly meant to manipulate the close. Um, so does anybody have any questions about what I just covered? Shop back there. Okay. We got a little construction work going on. I think Danny's shoot I think Danny's shooting somebody in the back, by the way. <laughs> no, we do. We got a lot of construction going on. But hey Raj, a couple of questions. How much weight does the do the ETFs carry now um over the broader markets? I mean, if you look at how much the ETFs have, the the the, uh, the size of the ETF market has just exploded. So I clearly think that it's it's much more than it was. I, 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 it's hard for me to put a quantifying number because it moves day to day, but it clearly uh, has a much greater effect of rebalancing at the end of the day than it ever has. And, and when you when you used to do like when I was on the floor for you and you you needed protection or you needed to like, you you had your long and your short book, and if you were short and the market was up, you were buying buying futures or doing SPX or whatever to cover that exposure. Mm -hmm. Now, what kind of exposure is there to um, the ETFs? To, now, late in the day, we have something called the MIM that shows. Let me show you real quick. Mm -hmm. It's um, this is a data feed from the New York Stock Exchange showing right now that there's 817. I got you guys' questions in a second. After 1817 million to sell. We're mm -hmm. kind of early right now. It's still mm -hmm. 45 minutes before the cash close, but mm -hmm. Do you, um, I remember sometimes you used to try to get a feel for me on what I was thinking about late in the day. And you would, like, if you were short and the market was up, you'd start buying minis. You'd try to beat the close by mm -hmm. buying some futures before 245. Right. Um, what is it? What is it that the ETFs do late in the day? I mean, do they also it's, have exposure? That yeah, well, ETFs late in the day, what they do is have to, they basically, just think about this. If they have, um, Say they have, there are no order. Say their um, outstanding shares don't change that day. The market's basically up or up or down two percent. They have to buy that much of their portfolio back just because of the rise. And so basically, what they do is say the day before, say something like a, a say spies very simply. So they have thirty billion dollars of um, the perfect weight S and P basket versus the spies that they are that are outstanding. So as the market go, say the market goes up. 2%, they've got to buy 2% of 30 billion if nothing changes because they just have to equally, they just have so to own, oh, they just have to have own a perfect basket of stocks so that, that perfectly equally, mimic, equally, that perfectly mimic the S&P 500. Equally weighted. Well, yeah, no, but cap weighted, but, yeah. but they know exactly how much they have to buy. So. And, and are, are the ETFs, like, we used to think of the MOCs as like the mutual funds, mm -hmm. but how, mu how much, how important are the mutual funds compared to like the ETFs? Now? I, I'd say the ETFs are as important, if not more important than the mutual funds at this and, point, and they, because, and, because it's easier to, it's easier to know what it's easier to predict what the ETFs have to trade like mutual funds, unless, unless they're like a weighted index, if they're just a, if, if, if there's discretion of the manager, it's hard to guess what they, they need to do. Right. But uh, with the ones that are like the perfect, you know, the, the perfect, in air quote, perfect basket ETFs, they need to know. So the market knows exactly what they need to buy and where they can front run right. back. And are those, are those guys kind of similar to the way you used to place orders on the, on the 245? Yeah, we used to actually do a lot of business for uh, ProShares, which was one of the, uh, one of the um, ETF or bigger ETF providers. So... Um, yeah, so we used to do a lot for them. And, and I mean, think about it very simply, right? Say you have a basket of 150 million REITs to sell into a close that's down 10%. I mean, would you, would you think that selling it at 3.30 and buying it back at 4 o'clock would probably be a good trade, <laughs> given like the weak, weakness of the market and given how much other people need to trade and given that how much you know, because essentially these ETFs, all they need to do is sell at the closing price. They don't care if they beat the closing price. Right. They just need to beat, they just need to, they essentially need to sell in the closing price. So if I'm selling, and once you get, once uh, as a trade, yes, you get that order, you're allowed to be in the market. You, you don't have to, you don't have to wait till the close. You have an order for them. And then they, so you, you have to deliver them 
the closing price. So essentially what you're doing is you're selling at 3.30 and buying it back at 4 o'clock. You're buying it back from them at 4 o'clock. Right. So, you're, so that's essentially, in weak markets, that's why you will almost always see um, weakness into the close. In, if, if, I'd say the, the wealth threshold is, if the market's going to be down 3%, um, by 3:30, there's a very there's a very small likelihood that's going to be higher than 3% at four o'clock. It's about more, with almost great uncertainty, it's going to be lower at four o'clock than it is okay. at 3:30. Well, I'd ask, what okay. would be the next product that the sh- crash? The, the market, market short term. I mean, that's that's a very loaded question. Is it corporate debt? Probably not. See, what was interesting about this was none of that other stuff moved during the when the market was mini crashing. Um, uh, bond yields, um, junk, um, corporate debt, none of that was moving at all. It was strictly an equity story. So that's how I knew it was just the VIX was leading it down. There was, no, there was nothing else. I mean, there's, what's the short next product? There, there's tons of, there, there's, I can answer this a hundred different ways, but more likely it's, uh, you know, unless, I, I, I personally think that the, the, the big product that could, if, if we just stop, if someone stopped, if the Chinese stopped buying our bonds, that would be the, that would be the issue. But I don't really see that happening. I think, I think that's just a game of chicken. But you know that to me would be uh, a big yeah. Because I don't I don't see the economy. The economy seem it doesn't seem like there's any real issue right here. As much as the media likes to make Trump whatever want, there's there's the the, the almost because the, the stimulus has kind of been taken out of the Fed, but it's been given back to companies with with the uh, the tax cut. So if the stimulus is actually back in the company's hands, not really the Fed's hands. So it's almost just it's been transferred to other places, which it should be, which should be um, a tailwind to the market. Yeah. Okay. Do you see the XBSY shut down? Um, possibly. Um, it's, you know, it, it's it's hard to predict, but the fact that so many people lost a lot of money, the SBXY is could be a uh, could be a target. It could be, I, put it this way. Even if it's not shut down, I certainly think that the uh, amount of people in that, in that crowded short ball trade are clearly much lower than it was. Um, so the LQD, LQD is, you know, an, it, it certainly could be, a, it hasn't really moved yet. So I don't know if that's the answer. I mean, I, I personally think that some of the, uh, the bond, like the, um, the sovereign debt ETFs where like, for example, like I looked at this the other day, I think that uh, because of the, these, some of these sovereign debt companies, I mean, these sovereign debt uh, nations, they're in these baskets of ETFs. Like you, you, you're actually, if you look at what you're actually lending, you're actually, you can actually lend um, to uh, Exxon Mobil at a higher interest rate than you can to Lebanon, which is insane. <laughs> like, yeah. I would clearly, I, I, I would clearly more feel more comfortable Exxon will pay me back than lend Lebanon. <laughs> right. Will the ETF ball squeeze out now? Do you think we avoid filling the gap and retesting the low? Um, you, you know, like we, we tested it once. Um, I would, it, you know, markets tend to think that they retest again, uh, but when and how quickly that is, it's hard. It's will be hard to predict. It could, it could be months. It could, it could be a long time. It could be a year. It, it's the thing is because I think it was such a ball driven event. Um, it's hard to it's hard, hard to recreate that. How about triple E? Will they survive? Uh, I think they're going to see a lot of scrutiny on triple ETFs. I, 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 I would be shocked to not see that. Because I mean, think about it. Is it's the point is simply to get around leverage, and you know, like if if you look at what happened in a history lesson, if you look at um, uh, CFDs for example, CFDs, you know, they were con- they're called contract for differences, and we the U.S. outlawed them in 2010, but they're still available around the world, and they were outlawed simply because of the um, amount of leverage that cra- that killed everybody in 2008. So will they survive? Uh, I, I I would be shocked to see what. I'll be shocked if there wasn't less scrutiny on them. How do I set stop, fix, time stops, one level, multi-level, what works best for you? Honestly, the way I set stops was, I, I, don't, I don't like to leave stops in the system. I, 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 this is how I do set my stops. I, I sit on my computer and I write them down right next to it. And when I get to that level, that's when I put them in. I don't like to, I don't like to let computers run my stops. I, I'd rather be disciplined. I mean, I understand if you have to go away from your screen, but. I'd assume most people on this screen are actually trading their own stops. I personally don't like to have machines control my stops. I control my stops. Okay, thank you. That does make sense.
Okay. <laughs> now I've got a question for you. You know, is, does is the sea is the sea boat in any kind of? Do you think that they're in any kind of trouble? I mean, do they have any problems? They, their stock fell sharply. Um, could they be on the hook for some of these losses, like uh, Credit Suisse and Nomura losses? Uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't. I would be. Uh... I wouldn't be shocked if there was. I don't know if they were due for losses, but certainly the um, the price fix or the manipulation. I mean, it, it's it is a uh, it is manip. It, it's it, it, see the, the bad thing about that is it's manip. It's been manipulated, but they've allowed to be manipulated by market makers, which are basically the owners or who is that a conflict of interest? Yes, I certainly think. Uh, so are, are, could they be in trouble? They, I, I would, I'd be shocked if they didn't have to pay some kind of fine along the way. And how much it is, I, I, that's hard for me to predict. Depends how good of a lawyer you get. But I mean, do, as, as an expert, would I say that, that you could call it manipulated? Absolutely. And what kind of fine, what kind of... Because they allowed their market makers, they basically allowed their own, they protected their own essentially. It's, it's not like retail could put in the same orders. They they could see the order book and the retail couldn't. So, it, it, does that sound wrong? Yeah. Does that test the smell test? It doesn't test the smell test of being okay. fair. Hedgehog is asking, what opt strategy would you like to use to play the VIX? I mean, quite quite honestly, I mean, right now, I mean, it, it really depends on the market. Like right now, I don't really. There's no obvious trade right here to play the VIX. I mean, I think it's come back to a more normal level. I, I, I think that I think the thing to worry about that to watch for though in the VIX is when it goes, it's resist the temptation to like get in front of like you know uh, the the dip or the in this case like the rally where when when stuff starts going, there's usually a, a, a it, it doesn't move orderly. It, it moves fast and moves quickly. So I mean what what I what I like what I was doing was I was just buying I was just literally as soon as this happened I saw this happening I just got long all the vol ETFs and and covered at good levels and it and what it did was it allowed me to actually buy stocks that I uh, that I wanted to buy at good fundamental levels cuz I I to my mind I had protection on and once it started moving your way you could you could actually cuz cuz they were going to move in opposite directions I mean, right now, to me, to, to be honest, I actually think the market is, I'm pretty, I'm getting, I'm not too worried about the market. I think vol is still at a somewhat inflated level. So the market fell off, um, the, the, the VIX will get high, will, will be bid up. Selling puts and names that you want to enter at a lower level is probably a pretty good strategy, which I did in a lot of names um, that week. Um, Boeing, um, Apple, JP Morgan. So they, just they, just names so they, names that I knew that were dislocated just because of this and and selling puts at lower at 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 very hefty premiums at, at, at and essentially even if I got through my levels I was very comfortable buying stocks at the, at, at those levels right. at the at the strike prices I was selling plus the inflated premiums. Now, um, what what are you doing now, Raj? What do you what are you doing for a living now? Uh, well, I, what I do is I um, I trade my own stuff and I do a lot of uh, I do a lot of retail uh, seminars for um, for retail investors. Um, I'm doing one in, and I and I do, I do vacation programs for them as well. So for example, I go to Thailand for two weeks in um, April with uh, another guy from Europe who is on the show a BBC show called Million Dollar Traders. So we basically teach retail traders how to think like professional traders. Yeah. So um, and I have I have seminars. Um, usually once a month, I think, uh, you could go to the, here, here's the website where you can, you can see where I'll be at. Um, let me see. I do work with these guys. I do, uh, big, I do seminars. I do, um, super conference with them and, um, the preferred speaker, especially uh, the, the next one I'm doing is about the, mar the market crash of 2018. Or how to pre how to prepare for it should it happen. So it's really for the idea is for retail investors to understand how professional traders work and how to protect yourself from big losses, and really how to the, the key to trading is to get rich slowly. Well, you all want to get rich quickly. That's what the lottery's for. But to get rich slowly in trading, that's the way to 
Yeah, grind it out, but also be smart about it. Like, and, and be opportunistic. You can't, volatility is a good thing, actually. Yeah. As much as it scares, it, scare, it, it sounds like an awful word on TV, but as someone who is traded, you need to be, you need to be prepared to love, you need to love volatility because volatility does equal opportunity. And be, to think about it like this, having your game plan, um, say like a football game, you prepare all week for the game. You have your game plan. And what, what, if, if you get, if you get uh, two minutes of the game, do you change your whole game plan? No, you got to prepare. You got to be prepared for, you want to play offense when everyone else is playing defense. And that's what, that's to me is what volatility is all about. And that's, it's, it's, the, it's being able to play offense when you play defense, when the other guys are playing defense. Right. You're more likely to score. I like you, Niels. <laughs> All right, so you guys, is there anybody else that has any more questions for Raj? You're going to get a shot at asking him some questions here before he goes back and plays golf. Um, anybody else got any questions for him? Trader Day. You've met Trader Day. Yep, of course. How do I use economic prints to get more ladies? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, I think what you'd... I think it's the, I think you have to go to the um, it's the law of supply and demand. You have to go where there's more supply, where 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 there's less where there's more demand and less supply for you. Yeah. And also the uh, the wealth of nations. Just remember, the wealthier you are, the better. It's it's you, you have a better shot. Squeeze it out. <laughs> yeah, squeeze it. All right. Well, you know what? And then one last thing. Where do you, where do you think the what's your short term view on the S and P, and what's your end of the year view? Uh, I, I the short term is it's, it's hard to say. I mean, I was pretty I was pretty bullish the last week and a half. Right now, I've been I've been putting some. Uh, I, I've been I, I'm I wouldn't say I'm neutral. I'm, I'm I'm still slightly long. I mean, I think we're in a bull market. So in a bull market, you either have to have three positions, right? You either have to be long, very long, or flat. I'd say I'm between flat and long, uh, but I think at the end of the, by the end of the year, I think we're, we're, we're going higher. I still, I, I do. I just think there's too much stimulus here. It might be a little rocky, but the, the key is here to just find names that you like, find, find, find stuff that you think is going higher and, 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 and look to add to it opportunistically. Okay. All right. So thank you very much, Raj. I appreciate you coming over. And um, what are you doing for dinner tonight? Uh, actually, I'm gonna have to go to Bermuda. It's a long story. I'm going to Bermuda tomorrow, but I might have to leave tonight. Okay. I got a golf tournament planned, so All gotta right. get ready. All right. Can't beat that. Thanks a lot. All right, buddy. All Thanks, right. guys. All right.